all of you here this morning. Glad to see everybody and, and really looking forward to our service today. Uh, as you can see, there are a lot of people here today uh, that are in pink, and I myself am wearing my hot pink power tie. And um, so nonetheless, uh, it's a tie that I, I don't wear very often other than the month of October. Uh, I do wear it to work some to celebrate Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And uh, for today, we asked people if they could to wear pink, and, and it's nice to see so many people in pink. And it's not specific to breast cancer awareness, but much more so uh, just awareness for cancer in general uh, and a way that we can celebrate those who have dealt with cancer uh, and, uh, you know, just a way to um, show some appreciation and some respect and some love for that. So, uh, you know, there are many people in this congregation that at some point have either personally dealt with cancer or they know somebody close to them who has. And so, you know, I think it's, um, it's a good time to take a moment and just reflect on that. And if you will, let's bow in prayer, and I'm going to pray, and then uh, we'll get into the rest of the service. God, thank you for your love for us and how much you care for us, God. And Lord, even now, I want to thank you for how you protect our lives and how you, um, uh, you're allowed to work through us. God, sometimes in such a difficult circumstance like cancer, Lord, there's many of us who've been personally impacted or with that we know somebody who has been impacted that's close to us, God. And Lord, I pray for those individuals. Lord, I pray for their survivors as well as the families uh, that have been touched. God, I pray that you show yourself strong and work through us so that we can show your love to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, uh, Moving on, uh, I always like to leave everybody with a verse, and uh, I think this verse today that I'm going to that I'm going to share with you is found in Colossians chapter three. Uh, it talks about the quality of our life and the quality of the things that we do. Uh, it says in verse twenty three, "And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not unto men." You know, a lot of times in our lives, we have to do things very well, and we should aspire to do things well. And uh, sometimes we don't have the skill or ability or the talent needed for the things that we're working on at that moment, but we still need to try our hardest and do our best because we need to do it as to the Lord. So I have a couple of photos this morning. You can bring the first one up, Cayman. We're doing a renovation in our house right now. Uh, we are actually finishing or refinishing the sheetrock ceilings, and I'm going to be painting the walls, too. Uh, it's one of these things on my project list um, that, um, that we as a family wanted to do. <laughs> and uh, why are y'all laughing? So anyway, so, uh, so I have decided to refinish the sheetrock ceiling because you've got to start at the top and work your way down, right? You don't, you don't go in and repaint all your walls and then decide to work on the ceiling, right? You start the ceiling and then work down. So there's a picture of the ceiling. So I have been, uh, you know, refinishing the sheetrock ceilings. Now, I'm not talking about repainting. I'm talking about refinishing, and then I will be repainting. So you can back up one slide, Cayman. So you can see the mess that this generates, right? Well, I am not a professional sheetrock finisher. I'll just go ahead and tell you that. I'm probably more experienced than most people that aren't because I grew up painting, you know, for a commercial painting company. And uh, now, Brother Troy could probably tell us a little bit about sheetrock finishing. You know, he's kind of done some of that throughout his life. But, but I'm not a professional. But I do try to do it very well. And I really like to do it to the best of my ability because I live in this house, right? I want it to look good. Okay, well, that causes a little bit of a disruption, as you can see. Uh, this has not been very easy on my family as I have been finishing this sheetrock. But it still doesn't give me the right to do it any less than as to the Lord, right? Now, if we take that same principle and apply it to every aspect of our life, if we're doing what we do, whatever it is, as to the Lord, then we need to make sure when we do it that God gets glory from it. Now, I know that's not convenient. And if you could see our entire living room and our kitchen and our dining room and the hallway, and you can imagine what happens when you walk through this, right? It's not easy, and it's not convenient. And this is just one little thing. I mean, but just think about when people see what we do and how we do it, they should know that there's something different, that the standard is we're doing it as to the Lord. 
whatever we do. If we live our lives like that, nobody can ever say that we're cutting corners and that we don't do our best for God. Would you stand as we worship the Lord? done for you.
Would you sing and worship a holy God this morning? There's none beside him, amen. Nothing, no one can compare to him.
tell him, here I am, as we sing this next verse. Here I am, exactly how I am. Take me and hold me. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Now I surrender. victory in him. He has given us the power unto salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for your love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That your salvation was made available to all who would believe and confess, Father. We love you. We praise you guide us, mold us, teach us, takes us, take us as you find us, fill our lives again, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray for all these things. Bless you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I appreciate not only your presence here in our auditorium, a good number out this morning, but those of you who are joining us online. And just for the record, in case uh, you all didn't hear, I've got some uh, spackling falling off my ceiling at my house. Shannon just volunteered. Y'all heard he said he would do his best, right? Isn't that a volunteer right there? I tell you what, the truth. I'll check with Dayla when they're finished over there and see how the process goes. But, amen. <laughs> hey, you know what? Shannon blesses me every week when he gives us a challenge and gives us something to relate to. And I appreciate uh, the fact of uh, him always sharing and helping us. We are continuing our story 
our salvation story of what God has done, God is doing, and God will do. <coughs> and I've said this every single week. Everybody has a story. Everybody. And by the fact that you're alive, you're still writing your story today. Oh, there's a point in time we get saved, but that's a starting point, and we write our story until the day we die and leave this earth. So you're writing a story. Today we're going to go to the book of Acts chapter 16. Uh, three words I want you to say with me. I've used these every single week. Lost, found, rejoice. Say it, would you? Lost, found, rejoice. Say it one more time. Lost, found, rejoice. That's the truth of the scriptures this morning. Uh, begin in a lost condition. We're found and rejoice over the salvation that takes place in our heart and life. Now, a specific title to this one this morning may be this simple. The most important question ever. The most important one. I don't know if you use a search engine like Google or whatever, but boy, in today's society, questions abound. I, I went online and just said, what's the most popular question? I, the question what? The most popular one worldwide is what is my IP address? For those of you a little bit up in years and unfamiliar, that's got something to do with your computer, okay? Uh, the second most popular question, what is love? And the third most popular question, according to Google, what time is it? I, boy, people waste time doing stuff like that, don't they? But not only what, but they why questions? <laughs> The most popular question worldwide, according to the Google search, why were cornflakes invented? I would have never even thought to ask that question. Would you have? My goodness gracious. Who? Most popular, who do I look like? My goodness. A lot of identity problems in these questions. The second most popular is who am I? This world's full of confusion. Not only what, why, and who, but when. Y'all know what the most popular search for the last 12 months was? When are the NBA playoffs? I can't believe that made the top spot in there. But when was the last full moon? When is Mother's Day? I mean, folks, come on. These are worldwide questions, most popular according to search. Where? Now, this one's the top. Where's my refund? Everybody likes that one, don't they? Huh? We get your taxes filed. Where's my refund? Uh, the second question, where am I? Wow. I mean, unbelievable. And they got some crazy one out there. On how. What, why, who, when, where, and how. How do I learn to draw? Man, just make you a little circle and put some stick figures on it, and you're an artist. I mean, what can I tell you? But how do I do it? Most popular searches worldwide with over 5 billion inquiries was a search for YouTube. Second was Facebook. Next was Gmail. And, of course, since this is a Google site, it listed Google. Amazing, though. You look for this year. Most popular searches, COVID-19. Getting information on that. Here lately, it's been overwhelmed with elections and voting. And will I get another stimulus check? Boy, that's a popular search right now. But on and on and on these things go. You know what? All these questions may be good and may be important to individual people. But they're not the most important question ever ask, even if Google says there's 5 billion inquiries about it. You know what? The most important question ever asked was asked by this man in today's story, the Philippian jailer, when he simply said, what must I do to be saved? This old crusty, hardened jailkeeper, the prison guard, the, the man who ran everything, he was so overwhelmed he asked simply, 
what must I do to be saved? You know, when you read this story, he could have said, how in the world did these prison doors get open like that? He could have said, why haven't all my prisoners escaped? No, no, no. He wanted to know one thing. What must I do to be saved? And as we look at this story this morning, I think we're going to see some amazing things. Three little simple points, three things I hope you'll take with you. Number one, the reason the question was asked. Number two, the response to the question. And number three, the results from that question. So let's dig into our story this morning. Let's look into this in the book of Acts, chapter 16, and start with the first and the reason the question was asked. Quick background here before we read the scriptures. Now you realize Paul and Silas had been on a mission trip. They'd gone out to spread the gospel. They were in Macedonia. They were there. They had stopped at a couple cities. Actually, just before this took place, a lady by the name of Lydia became the first convert in Europe. She trusted the Lord as is recorded in the scripture. Then Paul and Silas are going throughout the city. They're teaching about Jesus Christ and a demonic woman, a woman with the spirit of divination, has gone following them and she was making declarations which really were not helpful but they were very aggravating and very disconcerting to Paul and Silas preaching the gospel well lo and behold that after a few days there was enough of that Paul turned around cast the demon out of that woman no longer could she foretell things no longer could she have that spirit of divination the owners of that woman who were profiting from the 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 things that she was telling people got up in arms they drug Paul and Silas before the officials they said look they're teaching things contrary to the Roman way of life they're doing things that are not right and they stripped off the clothes from Paul and Silas they beat them with rods and they cast them into the prison and as a matter of fact they were so upset with them they told the keeper of the prison this Philippian jailer to put them in the inner prison and he locked them in inside the inner prison and bound them in stocks for preaching the gospel and casting a demon out of a woman. So we pick up the story here in Acts chapter 16. Look with me at verse 25. They've been in there for a while and about midnight, it says, Paul and Silas prayed and they sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the very foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened, everyone's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep, getting up from his bed really and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself supposing that the prisoners had fled. Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do thyself no harm. We are all here. Keeper of the prison called for a light. He sprang in and he came trembling and he fell down before Paul and Silas and he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let me tell you something. The reason this question was asked, two simple thoughts this morning. I hope this will help you. Number one, the question was provoked by fear. Now, you understand this this morning. God uses many different things to draw people to him. Lydia got saved earlier just by hearing the gospel. This Philippian jailer responded out of fear. I mean, wouldn't an earthquake kind of shake you up if you were in the midst of it, get your attention, cause you to pay attention? Lo and behold, he was provoked by fear. Now, when we read that story, here's the jailer ready to fall on his sword and kill himself. Under Roman law, the jailer had the responsibility for those prisoners. If one escaped, he paid for it with his life. No wonder he was overwhelmed with fear. No wonder he was uncertain as to what this future was going to hold. By the way, Every person who comes to Jesus Christ has to come by faith. And that's my second point under this reason. Not only was the question provoked by fear, it was provoked by faith. This question was asked by an honest heart wanting to know what would happen. Now, his very first thought, where's my prisoners? 
have they gone? I'll kill myself so I don't have to be tortured. I don't have to be beaten. I don't have to be taken by the people in authority and put to death to satisfy their desires. I won't let them do that. I'll kill myself. Instead, Paul and Silas didn't leave. Now, again, y'all know I, I, I stop and try to put myself in this. Here I am in the innermost part of the prison, couldn't see anything, taken in and then taking deeper in and put in stocks and having my legs bound so that I could not escape. What would be your first thought when the earthquake happened, the stocks broke, and you were free? Don't you all sit there and be spiritual and say, well, I would stay here like Paul did. You'd run for the hills just like I would have, wouldn't you? Hey, I'm free. I don't know how this happened, but praise God, I'm out of here. Here's this Philippian jailer. Now, there's an interesting little thing at the end of verse 25 when Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. It says the prisoners heard them. That word literally means they paid attention to what they were saying. So did the Philippian jailer. So did the one who was in charge of them. So not only did he ask this question, what must I do to be saved out of fear for all the things that had happened, but he asked it out of faith because he had listened to what Paul and Silas had been saying. You know, and it says they prayed, and then they sang praises. I, I, I often wonder what they sang. I'm sure it was some of the Psalms. But it could have just been a, a simple song that they made up about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Remember, this is a transition period. This is a time when we're moving from the temple worship in the Old Testament ways to the church age in the new worship in Jesus Christ. I don't know. I, you, I, I, when I think about this, I can't help but think of Brother Lester Roloff, who's in heaven. He would just start out and say, there's something mighty sweet about the Lord. There's something mighty sweet about the Lord. And then he would just sing and sing, and sometimes he was on key and sometimes he wasn't, but the Lord filled him and used him. I don't know what Paul and Silas sang, but I know that people paid attention to them. And I know that through their prayer and through their praise, the Holy Spirit pricked the heart of the prisoners and the jailkeeper. And the Holy Spirit did an amazing work to change them. Not only was this jailer's life spared physically, but his life was transformed spiritually. Whatever it takes to change a life for all eternity in saving grace in Jesus Christ is worth the difficulty. Some of you could tell me this morning, boy, I went through this or why I went through that or this happened in my life or that happened and it changed me. It got a hold of me. Let me tell you something very important this morning. God will use many different means to bring people to salvation. And he will work in a heart and life in many different ways. Some saved at a young age early in life. And praise God for that. Not going down the road to debauchery and sin. And, and ruining their lives with memories that just uh, plague them forever. Some live that way. And their life gets transformed later. But the same grace of God that saves a five, six, seven, eight-year-old it will save that 50, 60, 70-year-old who comes to him by faith. The reason this question was asked, it was provoked by fear. It was a trying circumstance. It was difficult. It was scary. But it was also provoked by faith. When that jailer realized that Paul and Silas didn't run away, nor did the other prisoners, but they stayed where they were supposed to, it got his attention. And all those praises, all those prayers, all the power that God had inside that prison got a hold of that jailer's heart. And he said, look, whatever this is you're singing about, I don't know a thing about it. 
but I sure would like to know. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Number two, the response they gave him to that simple question that he asked. Now, that response is amazing. Look back with me at verse 30, would you? They brought them out and they said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them that very same hour of the night, washed their stripes. He was baptized, he and all his, straightway. The question's asked, what must I do to be saved? The response is given. Ah, a person, a very specific person is mentioned. Their answer wasn't uh, deep, theological, a whole bunch of steps. It just said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that person that is only one able to say. You know, in our world today, and I've told you this before, when we self-quarantined there with uh, the COVID, I, I, I watched a number of different things on TV. Wow, are there some messed up religions out there, folks. And I'm sure they're good, meaning people. But they teach all kinds of things. And it's really just sometimes way out there about what you have to do and, and how you have to do it. And, and, and this is uh, one of many ways. I want to tell you something this morning. And I don't want you to miss it here in this auditorium or online while you're watching us. There's only one person and one way that will get any person into heaven for all eternity. And that's the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ and him alone, nobody else. By the way, do you know this? Jesus is the only one who left heaven to be born in human flesh. He is the same one who lived a perfect, sinless life while on this earth. He is the one who died for my sins and your sins on the cross. He's the only one that rose up from the third day because the Father was satisfied with the sacrifice he's made. He is the only one who's ascended right now back into heaven, seated at the Father's right hand, making intercession for me and for you forever and ever and ever. And it's only his blood that'll save us, not the blood of anything or anybody else, but the blood of Jesus Christ will wash us clean and change our lives forever. And you know what else? One day, and it won't be long, He's going to return from heaven and take those of us who are alive and remain on the face of this earth to be with him forever. Only Jesus Christ can save your soul. Religion can't. Church membership can't. Baptism can't. Only Jesus Christ can save your soul. And all God's people said. Listen, that's the only way we've got it. When they responded to that question, they responded with a person. Number two, they responded with a plan that they mapped out. And here's how simple it was. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe. Now look, belief carries with it the idea of repentance, turning from our sin and turning to the Lord. No doubt about it. But believe is much further than what we say is a head knowledge, an intellectual knowledge, a, a knowledge of facts. Believe is a knowledge that changes a heart and makes a difference in a life for all eternity. There was a missionary over in Africa who was translating the Gospel of John into the language of the African people. And, and he, he came to this word, believeth, in John 3.16. And there really was not a word in the African dialect that would translate that word, believeth, uh, so that it could be simply understood. I mean, for days he had prayed and wrestled with this. And, and one day he, he was out on his front porch and one of the native uh, young men came running down the roadway and, and saw the missionary. And so he went up on the porch and, and he just kind of flopped down right in that chair. And he said in his native tongue, Oh, it feels good to cast my whole weight upon this chair. Immediately, 
the Holy Spirit pulled the chain on the light bulb, and the light went off in the missionary spirit. He said, that's it. That's it. That word believeth means to cast your whole weight upon him. Nothing else will do. Trust him completely. So then and there, the missionary was able to put into the language of the African people what it means really to believe. Cast your whole weight upon him. And that's what Paul and Silas said. They said, listen, sir, it's not about being good. It's not about doing your best. It's not about holding to this or those traditions. It's really about casting all of your sin, all of your weight, all of your being entirely upon Jesus Christ and him alone. One more response. A promise is magnified. Look back at verse 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and here's the promise. Thou shalt be saved. Nearly 2,000 years ago, this was said to that man in Philippi in a jail cell. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the promise that Paul wrote to the Romans that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then and there in the middle of the night in one of the most unusual places you would ever expect to find it, revival broke out. A jailer was saved. His entire family came to faith in Christ because they had heard and believed the word of God. A a baptismal service took place and God changed a whole generation of people because a promise was magnified. You know what I want to tell you this morning? I want to tell you that that promise still holds true today. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Paul said in Romans 10 that whosoever shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Right before it said, after it said, whosoever shall confess Jesus Christ. Those are promises. And, and let me tell you something. God's never failed. He won't start with you or me. He's never let anybody down. His yea is yea and his nay is nay. And his promises are true for all eternity. Whosoever shall call shall be saved. Man, how simple. A response was given by these men in the middle of the night in a jail cell. Now look, and I talked about them a few weeks back, and I said we'll talk about the salvation story later. But it was on their prayer and praise. How you overcome a bad day? You pray and then you praise God. You have to do that. That's the only way you overcome that bad day. But the reality is these prisoners heard them. The jailer heard them and so their response was so pointed the lord jesus christ how do you get saved believe in that person and god keeps his promises that he'll save you forever religion all these religions of the world Tell us what we must do in order to get to heaven, in order to inherit eternal life, in order to, to have the future of eternity we want. Christianity is the only one that says it's not anything about what you do. It's all about what's been done for you by Jesus Christ on the cross to save you for, from your sins. Trust what Christ has done not what you can do to get to heaven. Ah, had a reason for the question. We had a response to the question. I like this. The results from that question. There's always results when you get the honest answer. Look with me, if you would, back at verse 32. They spake unto him the word of God, the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night. He washed their stripes. They were baptized. He and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house. He set meat before them. And rejoiced. Believing in God. With all his house. I don't know if you can get this picture or not. I don't know if you can see this. But this is a mean. Harsh. Cruel. Rough jailer 
And all of a sudden, we find out when the question was answered honestly and he put his faith and trust in Christ, he became a new creature. Number one, this result is it led to salvation by the Lord. Not Paul, not Silas, not the church, not the way, but it led to salvation by the Lord. Verse 32 says they heard the word of the Lord. Verse 34 says he believed and he was saved. His household followed him and in obedience they were baptized even right then. You know Psalm chapter 3 verse 8 makes such a profound statement. It says salvation belongs to the Lord. Now listen very closely to me. Listen to me online. Baptists don't have an inside road to that. Pentecostals don't have an inside road to that. No religion has an inside road to that. The truth is found in the Word of God and that alone. Now, I believe I'm a Baptist because I believe it's closest to this book. Don't get me wrong right there. But I believe any man, woman, boy, or girl at any place under any circumstance, if they'll put their faith and trust in the Lord and confess their sins and acknowledge Him as saved, they can be saved wherever they are, whatever church they're a member of. God is no respecter of persons. But salvation comes by the Lord. I used these verses last week. I've quoted them time after time after time. When Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Remember verse 9, Not of works, lest any man would have reason to boast. It's not the good things we do. Salvation is by the Lord and Him alone and nobody else. Number two, the second result, it produced service to the Lord. Now listen very closely, body of Christ. If you're genuinely saved, you cannot help but serve God. That's part of our life. Uh, we quote verses 8 and 9 of Ephesians chapter 2, but verse 10 says, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained. We should walk in them. We will serve. Look back at verse 24 of chapter 16. This jailer received this charge. He thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in stocks. That word thrust means that he threw them in like you would throw garbage out with no regard, no respect, uh, uh, no concern for them. Just threw them in there. Look at verse 34. 33, I mean. That same hour he washed their stripes and he brought them into his house and set meat before him. Can I tell you what a change took place in this jailer's life? Can I tell you that from being the mean, cruel, hard, crusty old man who just threw them into the inner prison with no regard for their safety or well-being, he became one who then wanted to tend to their wounds, wanted to clean up the cuts from where they had been beaten, who wanted to take care for them, and then wanted to be sure they had a good meal. Can you believe such a new creature? Can you believe how much he changed and what a difference God made in his life? Immediately, he didn't have to wait six months, a year, two years. Immediately, he began to serve out of a thankful heart of what God had done for him. Immediately, did he know all the scriptures? Absolutely not. Did he know all the things pertained to the beliefs? Absolutely not. But he did know one thing. Just a few minutes before, he was on his way to hell and destruction, and now he was a new creature in Jesus Christ. His sins had been forgiven. His life had been changed, and he wanted to serve God as best he knew how. He'd clean up those guys who had been praising God and singing praises to him and help them and feed them and do something good for the men of God. Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah! It changed him. It produced service to the Lord. Got one more right here. It yielded satisfaction in the Lord. 
I specifically chose three different prepositions. Salvation is only by the Lord. Service we do is to the Lord. Isn't that that verse you use? Do whatsoever we do unto the Lord. And satisfaction is found in the Lord and him alone. That last part of verse 34 says, He set meat before them and he rejoiced, believing in God with his whole house. Now, again, back up about 2,000 years with me, would you? And let's just be that fly on the wall in this man's house that's connected right there to the prison. And let's listen to this conversation that's taking place. He's dressed their wounds. He's ministered to their stripes. And now he's got meat before them. Paul, I want you to know something. I've had all kinds of prisoners in my day. Some of the roughest characters you think you could ever find anywhere. And I'm telling you, these guys would scream at me. They would threaten me. They would spit at me. They would swear at me. You all didn't do any of that. And I thought, well, this is kind of strange. I mean, they've been beaten and and bruised and battered, and, and I'm throwing you in here and locking you up. But you didn't fuss at me at all. You know what? After a little while, y'all have been praying, and I was listening to what you were saying. And then I heard you all singing in the middle of the night of all times. And you know what? I really thought, well, they got beat so bad you've lost your mind. You know, you, you're just delirious. You don't know what's going on. But you know what? As I listened, you were praising God for putting you here. You were praising God for loving you and counting you worthy. You were exalting the name of somebody I knew nothing about and saying, thank you, Jesus, for doing all this. I I tell you, I just did not understand. And then that earthquake hit. Now, I tell you, I was scared literally to death. I was really ready to take my life because I knew what was about to happen. And every single one of you could have gotten away. Every one of you could leave. But no, you didn't leave. You stayed right here. And you know what you did? You said, hey, don't worry. We're all here. We're all safe. Nobody's running away. You're not going to be in trouble. And you know what? Right then, my whole heart got just torn asunder. How could somebody who's been done this way not run off when they had the chance? And what you did, that singing, that praying, that praising, every bit of it made sense to me. And I ran in there to you, and I couldn't just help but fall at your feet and say, I need to know what I got to do to be saved and know about this man. And you know what? Hallelujah. Jesus saved me just like he saved you, and my life has been changed forever, and I can rejoice, and I can just tell everybody what good things has happened to me. I want you to know something. 2,000 years later, Jesus is still able to transform the dead into the living he's able to take that which is lost and make it found he's able to take the miserable and turn it into the joyful he's able to change a sinner into a saint and he fills the hearts of children that of his children that are burdened and broken with peace and joy and rejoicing with his presence in their lives let me ask you this Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? Do you have any idea of what I'm talking about? This most important question in the whole wide world was asked. What must I do to be saved? They responded. It's in a person. Oh, here's the path you've got to follow. And I tell you what, the power of God moved in and saved him forever. Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ will lift the curtain of gloom and doom from your life if you're not sure, if you don't know. Well, Brother Donald, I, I, you know, I, I said a prayer years ago. I'm glad you did. But if you don't know for sure in your heart and life that the Lord Jesus Christ has changed you, then you need to have a checkup and do it. Acts 16.31, how many times have we quoted that verse? It's so simple. 
Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thine house. God will save you when you cry out to him. So I end it with this this morning. What's your story? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Do you know that if this is your last day upon the face of the earth, you're going to heaven? Do you have a story of salvation? Take a deep breath and imagine with me for just a minute, would you? Just imagine that we're standing before the portals of heaven and things aren't the way we've always believed them to be. But to get into heaven, God has designed a 1,000-word, I mean question, test. And this question's about him, about his love, about the word of God and the things of God and how we ought to live our lives and the things we ought to do. And in order to get into heaven, we have to answer every single question exactly right miss one question one point and we miss it all i don't know about you but i don't think i'd have a lot of confidence to stand up there knowing i had to answer a thousand questions perfectly and not miss one As a matter of fact i'd probably get so nervous and upset i'd blow it on the first question to be honest with you but here you are you're standing in line the person in front of you goes and you're next, and you hear your name called to come up to the pearly gates. And as your name's called, your palms are sweaty. Your steps are just heavy like lead. You're dreading this. You just know it's not going to work out. And as you're there, all of a sudden you feel a light tap on your shoulder. And you turn around, and there stands Jesus. He said, hey. You mind if I take this test for you? You can have my score. I'll take your place. And you know what? You don't have to do a thing. Just let me take this for you. And you can come in on my answers. Listen to me. That's exactly what he did, folks. That's exactly what he did. All my efforts... It's not by silver and gold, Peter said. It's not the good things I've done. It's not the things that I've held on to. No, 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 no. It's what Christ has done for me. It's what he did for the Philippian jailer. It's what he's doing today for anybody that will call upon him. So very simply, have you trusted Christ? Have you at home put your faith and trust in the only one that can save you? If not, it's real simple. Um, admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus Christ died to save you from your sins. Call out to him and confess those sins. And his promise is he will forgive you. If we can ever help you at Victory Baptist Church, call us. We'd love to do that. We'd love to be a blessing. I'd love more than anything else to take the word of God and show you what Christ has done. Please feel free to call us, stop by, and we'll be glad to help you. Thank you for joining in. By the way, we have services tonight at 530 as well here in the auditorium. They're not online. But if you can't join us in person, we'll see you. Well, no, this Wednesday night we got trunk or treat. We'll see you next Sunday morning at 1035 with a time change. God bless you. Thank you for joining in today.